This is unlike anything I've built before, a water-cooled open build case that looks more like a piece of art than a PC. The vertical design really shows off all your hardware while having a lower noise level and fantastic thermal performance since it's always pulling in fresh air. Let's take a look at the components I chose for this build, see what it's like to put something like this together, and then we can check out the thermal and gaming performance. For the CPU, I'll be using the 7800X3D. This is widely considered the best gaming CPU you can buy at the moment, and it's accelerated with 3D vCache, which gives it better performance in gaming. I also wanted something that is going to pair well with a top tier GPU, like what we'll be using today. So the 7800X3D is currently priced at $450, and has eight cores, 16 threads, and a boost clock up to five gigahertz. The 7800X3D also requires a new AM5 motherboard. I'm gonna be using the Gigabyte B650i AORS Ultra. There are pretty limited options for AM5 mini ITX motherboards at the moment, but in the future, I would probably go with an X670 chipset when there are more options available. Still, this has everything I would need with plenty of USB ports, including a Type-C port and a load of other features like Wi-Fi 6E and a BIOS flashback button. This motherboard has a load of storage options as well. It can fit two M.2 drives under the heatsink, one Gen 5 and a Gen 4, and then there's room for an additional Gen 4 drive on the back under the backplate. I'll only be using a single two terabyte Gen 4 Samsung 980 Pro for now, as this will be more than enough storage for my needs, and it's much less expensive than a Gen 5 drive, which really wouldn't give any meaningful benefits over a Gen 4 in gaming anyway. Okay. So now let's install our RAM, and for this build, we're going to need DDR5 memory. So I'm going with 32 gigs of DDR5 6000 Corsair Dominator Platinum RAM. These sticks are specifically designed for AMD builds with an Expo memory profile and at that 6000 megahertz speed, which is optimal for 7000 series CPUs. So we just wanna make sure the notch is correctly aligned and then apply even pressure until you hear it click into place. For the CPU cooler, I'm going with a new NZXT Kraken Elite 240. I think this liquid cooler looks awesome with a fairly large 2.3 inch 60 hertz LCD display that looks very clear and bright. Now in most ITX builds, it's really not worth spending the extra money on a CPU cooler with a screen. But in this build, this is gonna serve as the centerpiece for the entire thing. We will be installing the majority of the cooler later, but for now, let's just install the mounting hardware. So first, we just need to remove the stock AMD mounting bracket by unscrewing these four screws and then removing them. The cooler uses the existing backplate, so we can leave that in place. Then we can grab the four AMD standoff sleeves and orient them with the AM5 side up. Put the standoffs through the sleeves and finger tighten them to the motherboard. And that's all we need to do to prep the motherboard for now. Let's put that aside and take a look at the case. So this vertical open case is called the X-Proto L. This is a slightly larger version of the X-Proto, which supports triple slot graphic cards and ATX power supplies. You do have to assemble the whole case, but it's actually not too difficult, and XTIA does an awesome job organizing everything to make the process a bit easier. They also include an interchangeable screwdriver with the two bits needed to assemble the whole thing. The metal pieces here feel really high quality and well machined. Okay, so let's start assembling everything. And to start, we just need to place the square spacers into the squared indents on the back side of the plate and screw them into place from the opposite side. Then we can grab our power supply. I'm gonna be using an RM850E from Corsair in this build. If you go with an ATX power supply, you will wanna make sure that it's less than 150 millimeters in height. Otherwise, you won't have room for cable management or be able to fit the ITX motherboard above it. This case does come with a bracket for both ATX and small form factor power supplies. So we're gonna grab the ATX bracket and then align the holes and secure it with four screws. Now we can start plugging our cables into the power supply and I highly recommend buying some flexible cables for this build. XTIA sells some on their site that are highly flexible and at a custom length for this build. That's what I ordered and will be using today, but you could also get away with Corsair's premium sleeves cables. I'm also using a Corsair premium 12 volt high power cable for the GPU. If you try to use standard cables, you'll likely have to bend them in ways that aren't recommended and the whole build process will be much more complicated. Okay, so let's route the CPU and motherboard cables through the routing holes and feed the PCI Express 4.0 riser cable through the pass-through on the plate. Then I'm gonna grab a few of the motherboard accessories that I know I'm gonna wanna hide. So 
That's the USB 2.0 adapter that I'll need for the AIO later and this breakout board for the front panel connection. Now we can grab the four copper motherboard standoffs and screw them into the four holes on the structure plate. Let's grab the motherboard, align it to the standoffs and secure it into place. Now we can connect our CPU cable on the left, the motherboard connector and the breakout card on the bottom. I actually removed the RAM to make these connections a little bit easier to reach, but then we can connect the PCI Express riser cable and the USB 2.0 adapter on the left. I also need to grab the breakout cable for the AIO and make those connections for the USB and SATA power and feed that through to the front of the motherboard as well. And now we can do a little bit of cable management on the back to make things easier to work with. So let's grab the other structure plate and install the power button by feeding it through the dedicated hole, tightening the nut, and then routing the cable through the pass-through. Putting the plates side by side and we can connect the power button to the front panel connections on the motherboard. This would also be the time to route the power cable extension if you wanted to, but I actually plan to have this in the vertical orientation and don't want the power cable coming out the top of the case, so I won't be doing that here. Okay, so it's almost time to secure the plates together, but before we do that, I do want to connect the fans for the AIO while it's still easy to access them. So we can connect those now and leave them on the side until we're ready for them. Now let's lower the other structure plate down and route the PCI Express riser cable and GPU power cable through the holes. And we can also run this angled display port extension down the middle as well. If you have a very flexible power cable for your GPU, you can pass it through the cutout on the second backplate. But because these 12 volt high power connectors are a little stiff, I'm gonna route mine around the side. Okay, so now we can secure the two plates together with the six included screws and install the two copper standoffs for the PCI Express riser cable. Now it's time to install the GPU, and I'm gonna be using the RTX 4090 Founders Edition. This GPU is in a league of its own and absolutely dominates all other GPUs in performance, but it is quite expensive and way overkill for most people. Still, I wanted to get the max out of this build, and this GPU with a 7800X 3D is gonna give the highest performance that money can buy today. The Founders card is pretty difficult to come by as well. I've only seen them drop on Best Buy once per month for the past few months, and they sell out quickly. This case can support a GPU up to 345 millimeters, so you should be able to fit most third-party GPUs here as well. Let's take the graphic card IO fastener and secure it to the 4090. Then align it to the IO hole on the case and fix it with the three screws. Then slide the PCI Express riser cable onto the GPU and then fasten that to the standoffs. Once that's complete, we can secure the bottom GPU fastener with the two screws and plug the 12 volt high power cable into the 4090. Last thing to do here is to install the AIO. And to do that, we can align the two fans to the eight holes on the radiator, then align the AIO bracket and fasten it with the eight screws. They do also offer brackets for 280 millimeter and 360 millimeter. Then we'll need to change the retention bracket on the pump to the AMD bracket. To do that, you can push in and rotate the bracket counterclockwise. Then do the opposite to install the correct one. Now let's fix the AIO side panel to the case and align the holes from the bracket to the side panel. We can then fasten it with four screws, two on the top and two on the bottom. My pump already has thermal paste applied, so I'll be using that. Otherwise, you can apply a pea-sized amount to the center of the CPU and lower the block onto the standoffs. Now let's tighten the four thumb nuts in an X pattern to ensure even pressure across the CPU. Finally, let's plug the AIO breakout cable into the pump and CPU fan header, secure that last decorative side panel, and that's the build complete. Before we talk about performance, if you want to see more builds like this, it would mean a lot if you subscribe to the channel if you're not already. It really helps the channel so that I can make more videos like this for you. So thank you. Performance here is unsurprisingly insane. This setup can easily handle 4K and 1440p in high and ultra settings, no problem. The right pairing here would be a high refresh rate 4K display, but I could definitely see the case for a high quality 1440p monitor, starting with Cyberpunk in 4K with just rasterization, so that's without DLSS or ray tracing, and we're getting 75 to 80 frames per second. This is already a great experience, but with the 4090, you can turn on ray tracing ultra settings along with DLSS and frame generation and still get around 70 to 80 frames per second. 
If you're hooking this up to a 1440p display, then you're getting around 140 frames per second in rasterization performance. All right, taking a look at Hogwarts Legacy here in 4K and rasterization performance is easily over 60 to 70 frames per second on maxed out ultra settings. Now, again, you can utilize DLSS and frame generation to get a nice increase in frame rate. And if you use those features in 4K, we're looking at a massive bump to over 130 frames per second. And temps are no problem at all. The NZXT Kraken is having absolutely no problems keeping the CPU cool and the open case design is allowing all of the components to pull fresh air. In Apex Legends, again, in 4K max out high settings, and we're getting great performance here at over 150 frames per second. And if you want to satiate a 240 hertz 1440p monitor with the highest settings, this will do that no problem. For GPU thermals, I ran Heaven Benchmark for over an hour, and the 4090 is averaging 62 degrees Celsius. And to test CPU temps, I ran a 10 minute multi-core stress test in Cinebench R23, and temps maxed out at around 69 degrees, but averaged at 60 65 degrees Celsius. The NZXT Kraken is handling the 7800X 3D without any issue. All of these games and synthetic benchmarks are done with an ambient room temperature of 24 degrees Celsius and using the silent profile in the NZXT's cam software. Okay, so it's hard not to be happy with the performance of this machine, but I will say that this is not necessarily a build for everyone. This is definitely more for an enthusiast who, of course, wants to show off all of their components. It doesn't protect your parts from kids, pets, or dust, but if you have a shelf or a space that can keep it out of reach, this is a pretty cool option. I'm really impressed with the Xproto's build quality as well. The whole machine feels very sturdy and well put together. The case here, along with the PCI Express riser cable and 240 AIO bracket, was around $185. But this build altogether was quite expensive when you factor in the 4090 and everything else. This config totals at around $3,450, but you obviously don't need to use the same components I did here to get a great looking build. But anyway, let me know what you think about the build in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.